I am here with, a, with just a wonderful gentleman, practitioner, thought leader, Dr. Stephen Djurjevic. Welcome, my friend. Welcome to you, Mark. I'm glad to be here with you. Same here. Let me brag about you for a minute or two, and then we're going to launch in. Uh, so Dr. Stephen is a psychologist specializing in mind-body medicine. He's the clinical assistant professor of medicine at the University of Arizona College of Medicine and director of the mind-body clinic uh, with Dr. Uh, Andrew Wiles, Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. So Dr. Stephen continues his 41 years of private practice at Behavioral Medicine Limited in Tucson, Arizona. He is a fellow, approved consultant, and faculty of the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. Other memberships include Society for Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis, American Psychological Association, and lots more. And, and you know, you've been, you've been doing this work. You've been in the trenches you know, on a clinical level, on a teaching level for quite some time. I, I'm just wondering if you can start us out how you got on the journey of hypnosis, mind-body medicine, working with patients. What happened? <laughs> well, it was quite by accident, actually. I, I was 14 years old and working as a stock boy in a bank in downtown Gary, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And after work one day, I went upstairs above one of the department stores and there was a radio station. I wanted to see what went on in radio stations and they had a conversation, a dialogue, and I watched through a glass uh, pane the, of a, uh, they had a, uh, like a medium, a psychic, but they had a hypnotist there, sort of a creepy looking fella. And the question was posed to him, can you hypnotize anyone? And he turned around and saw me in the glass pane watching and he said, yes, I can even hypnotize him. And he pointed at me, and it just scared the heck out of me. And I ran out of there. And on my way home, I, I went past the public library. And I, it, it scared me enough that I went in and asked the librarian, what is this hypnosis? And I was really blessed. She pulled out a two-volume set called Medical Hypnosis, written in the 1940s by Louis Volberg at mm -hmm. the Medical Institute in New York. And that taught me how to produce my own anesthesia for dentists in, when I went to the dentist, how to overcome my needle phobia, how to improve test taking. And then it was 10 years later, I was at in graduate school and I started having disabling panic attacks. And when the psychiatrist and psychologist I was seeing said it's only stress, I thought, wow, how could you go through pharmacy and all these other undergraduate programs and never hear it mentioned, but it led me to going back to my training in hypnosis, self-hypnosis for me, and uh, applying it to the anxiety and panic attacks, with, and it worked great. And that, I, I immediately changed my curriculum in graduate school and put together a lovely blend of psychology, sociology, medicine, uh, rehabilitation to create what at that time was called behavioral medicine. That's when biofeedback was first coming out and evolving in the early 70s, and which we call it mind-body medicine now. But uh, I've been obsessed with it, the mind-body connection since. And over the years, I've done biofeedback and a variety of other methods, but I still find hypnosis to be really the fast track, the easiest, the fastest, the most expedient way to access the mind-body connection uh, for healing and for therapeutics. So that's how I got into it, and I'm still into it, and um, yeah, still very much into it. That's pretty much all I do. Yeah. So I want to underline something that you just said for one moment, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. You said that, you know, through all the work that you've done uh, in mind-body medicine, that, that you found that hypnosis is is sort of the fastest inroad into that mind-body connection. I think in a perfect world, if there was a different term or if we can just kind of wash away whatever people associate when they hear the term hypnosis, we could all start from a great place. Um, and, and, and yet, you know, here we are with this kind of, there's a little bit of a cultural um, coloring of the term. So I'm wondering if you can set us straight and explain, you know, really in a basic way, what exactly is hypnosis? How does it work? Mm -hmm. And how do we 
kind of separated out from what I think a lot of people think of uh, when they, you know, see the Las Vegas show. Certainly. And you're absolutely right. I mean, going back to when the the term was coined, the word hypnosis came from a fellow named Villiers in Paris or in France. And that was a time when John Elliotson, the fellow who brought the stethoscope to England, created the first hypnotic hospital, hypnosis hospital in London, and the first medical journal on medical hypnosis. But very rapidly, the a lay population latched onto it, turned it into entertainment, much like stage hypnotists do now, and it just colored it or stained it with this uh, the illusions that stage hypnotists frequently rely upon. Um, but And so that's the biggest obstacle or the first obstacle I have to deal with with everyone is that how they've been uh, colored, the word's been colored. So the, the myths and misconceptions about hypnosis are that it's done to somebody. Somebody gets hypnotized. And I tell the patients I work with, you know, I, I've been doing this for 41, going on 42 years now. I've never hypnotized anyone any more so than I could have meditated them or yoga them. You know, it's, it's not done to somebody. All hypnosis is really self-hypnosis. Um, and I know when people ask uh, Bella Ruth Napperstack and myself, uh, well, what's the difference between hypnosis and guided imagery? And I really admire her for using that word instead of hypnosis because she doesn't have to swim against as much current as I do with the word hypnosis. We'll both say there's, there's no difference. They're, they're the same thing. You know, any of the, the mind-body methods that rely on thoughts uh, and images and pictures to send messages of our intentions through our subconscious or body-mind uh, or mind-bodies, moreover, that's it. So there's no going under. There's no loss of consciousness, a loss of control. In fact, it's a heightened form of control. And uh, it's not done to anyone. But it is a relaxed or passive form of concentration, almost identical to a daydream. For when we're in a daydream, we're, we might be staring with our eyes open. We're seeing, but we're not looking. We're hearing, but we're not necessarily listening. And we can stare with all of our senses. And that's why it's so valuable for pain or helping people with pain problems, because if they can stare with the tactile kinesthetic a sense of feeling touch, you don't feel parts of the body that may be having a procedure or uh, undergoing a healing after a bad injury or burn. Um, so the reality is that when somebody's doing hypnosis, even when they're in a deep state of hypnosis, they're fully aware of where they are, what they're doing, and but it's but they're more absorbed with their own within their own thoughts and ideas, which are carefully crafted to be images and ideas for healing, comfort, uh, performance, uh, and you know, I, as I tell them, you know, your thoughts are things you can't see them, but you know you have them, mm -hmm. and those thoughts are sending are resonating throughout this community of ten trillion cells, living cells of the body. Um, so that they begin thinking the same intention, the same message. So that's pretty much in a nutshell my quick version of here's what hypnosis it really is. Yeah, and, and and I love that nutshell. I'm wondering if there's some useful, simple science that can help us understand um, what the mechanism might be. Uh, just for just for the mind to chew on here, like how 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 does science say this works, or how might it hypothesize that mm. hypnosis works? Boy, there's a lot of competing theories about that, and I would say 40 years ago, um, we thought um, that, uh, we thought it was one thing. It turns out to be another. But we now have functional PET scans, functional MRIs that show that. There's activity going on in different locations within the brain that are very, very consistent with what the suggestion is. So if you're suggesting to somebody that they're turning off their right foot so they don't feel anything or their right foot's asleep, you can touch their right foot in the part of the brain where the right foot would ordinarily light up on touch doesn't light up. Or you can tell somebody you're touching their right foot with a nail and it's a real sharp nail. And even though you're not touching them at all, 
the brain lights up as if they were being touched. So, you know, it, what for me, what it did was validate something I've been saying to people for years is that this mind of our body, this, we'll call it a subconscious because it's beneath our thinking level of awareness, this mind of body or body mind cannot tell the difference between what is real and what we imagine. And think of the times when you've been frightened by something or worried about something, and it turned out the thing that you were afraid of wasn't scary at all. It wasn't what you thought it was. But your body reacted as if it was real, because that mind of body isn't the thinking mind. It, but it does resonate or vibrate to those thoughts and intentions that we have consciously in mind. Mm. You know, it, it's... What you just said to me is so profound, and that is that the brain isn't distinguishing between the real and the unreal, but it's operating as if it's real. Absolutely. Uh, that's phenomenal. Yeah. When uh, I, I worked part-time uh, at one of the IBM plants uh, here in Tucson, Arizona, and Typically, there were stress-related disorders, and the physicians in the department would send the, the engineers to me to teach them some relaxation techniques with hypnosis for stress. And the, engine, the male engineers in particular, the male engineers were the ones that really, and having gone to Purdue University, I'm familiar with working with engineers and come from that background, uh, the first thing I'd have to do with them is, you know, they're telling me, I don't know why I'm talking to you. You know, I've got bronchitis or I've got irritable bowel syndrome or I have, uh, you know, headaches. And I'd say, no, let's just go sit outside. It's June in Tucson. Temperature's 105. We'll sit under a shade tree. It's a dry heat. So in the shade, it's still 105, but it's hot, but not unbearable. And I'll have them close their eyes. And with their eyes closed, I'll have them imagine you're back in Poughkeepsie or Rochester, New York. It's winter. It's the coldest day you've ever felt. You came to work in a sports jacket. And by the time you get off work, a blizzard's moving through New York State. And as they're imagining and I'm coaching them with their eyes closed, this cold, this bitter cold, when I see goosebumps on their arms, I ask them, Open your eyes, look at your arms, and tell me, did those goosebumps come from 105 degrees shade where we're sitting, or did it come from what you put in your mind? And usually that's all it takes. That, mm. Then they got it. And that's why biofeedback is so helpful for, for the non-believer, because it shows them. The, if you think of somebody who makes you angry, you see changes in heart rate, muscle tension, uh, other, other, sense, other measures that we can sense or measure with equipment. So... Um, does that answer your question? Absolutely, absolutely. So on a practical level, um, I go to someone who practices clinical slash medical hypnosis. What might some of the techniques look like? Okay. Um, well, first off, they would probably want to do an assessment, and they would do that probably pretty quickly with you by talking with you to make sure that there's not something that would say, this is not somebody to do hypnosis. This is somebody where you don't want to do hypnosis. So people with serious or severe mental disorders, you want to treat them very carefully, and you don't want to dive into doing hypnosis with them or refer them to somebody who deals with that. But if they basically just have a you know some kind of functional complaint, uh, irritable bowel, for example, asthma, um, it might be first first answering their questions, dispelling the myths and misconceptions we talked about just a few minutes ago, and then uh, having them just basically learn to get a feel for what it's like when they deliberately, intentionally produce a daydream. So they might sit in a, be sitting in a chair in my office, and I'll have them close their eyes and maybe uh, notice their breath for a while. Uh, then I'll suggest that it wouldn't. Perhaps you might discover that if you think about your arms becoming heavy and relaxed, they may become heavy. And as I'm talking about how heavy your arms are becoming as they relax, for you, they might be becoming weightless or floating. You'll discover what changes first as you begin directing your attention inward, for that is giving a power to the message that your mind body is listening to within your own thoughts and ideas. I might suggest you're on a beach, and it's a warm, sandy beach with a safe, gentle sunlight. But you might be picturing an alpine meadow up in the mountains because that's more comforting to you, and you don't like beaches and sand. Um, they first discover that they're totally in control of the experience 
And my role is only to be a guide, a, 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 te- a guide that basically knows how to be a good guide to help them have an experience that gives them uh, the experience of physical alterations, alterations in perception uh, that cause physiological changes in their body consistent with their goals. Uh, so that would be pretty much goes on what happens within the, the first session within my office. And then often by the end of the session, uh, I'll make it more of a, f- once I know more personal information, it'll be more formalized in that I'll teach them a very specific, maybe an indu- we call it a hypnotic induction method, methods or hypnotic induction techniques such as stare at a spot on the wall or uh, follow your breathing or releasing thumb and finger with a breath. Um, they're all, as I tell my patients, they're all just starting points. That's another word for hypnotic induction methods. They're starting points on a gentle journey into the center of yourself. Mm-hmm. And then I'll record the entire 25, 30 minute experience so they can take it home and rehearse and practice because we know that it takes about 21 days or more to create a habit. Mm-hmm. And we do know, you, the earlier question you asked about what, what's the mechanism going on we do know there's a neuroplasticity effect. People that repeat any activity develop a new uh, learned pattern within brain, a new circuit, so to speak, in brain is being created that in many cases we want to use to replace a previous pattern of discomfort or, or illness or some aberrant symptom. So they'll take that home and for 21 days they're basically rehearsing and if we rehearse anything, pretty soon the mind body just does it. So, you know, you drive home from work and you don't tell your feet what to do. They work the pedals for you. Mm-hmm. You ride a bicycle, you don't have to tell your hands how to hold the handlebars or steer, steer it or use a pencil or a keyboard. This mind body knowledge or wisdom comes about from rehearsal. So we learn hypnosis through the experience of hypnosis. A book won't do it. Uh, we, that you have to have the experience because that's what it's learned from. You can give somebody an encyclopedia on bicycle riding. It won't teach them to ride a bike. Same thing with an encyclopedia on sodium chloride, table salt. But if you put some of that salt on their tongue, they know it forever. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with hypnosis. If you have that experience of what it's like to be so in control from within, um, it's very empowering. It's very motivating to use it and apply it, particularly when uh, you can see results so rapidly. Mm. Um, so that's pretty much what goes goes on in an office or in, in a clinic where some a practitioner is using hypnosis for uh, the part of, to introduce hypnosis for a possible therapeutic mo- modality. Mm-hmm. You know, Doctor Stephen, as you were think as you were speaking, I, I was thinking how on one level. Um, It sounds like what you're doing, what we're doing with these techniques is giving people another way to train them to use the process of mind. You know, like nobody ever really necessarily sat me down and said, okay, Mark, here's how you use your mind as a tool. Here's some of the tricks you could do. Mm -hmm. I sort of de facto learned, here's how you do math. Or maybe here's how you memorize things so you can take Mm -hmm. a test and do well. But you're basically teaching tools and techniques that allow people to start to harness (laughs) the power of the mind in ways that that they just probably never tried before. That's right. Every one of us have talents, skills, gifts within us that are undiscovered. Mm -hmm. Like if you ask somebody, do you play the clarinet? Yeah, their first response might be, no, I don't. Um, But that person with a little bit of rehearsal and some guidance can learn to play the clarinet. The talent is within them. You know, do you know how to lower your blood pressure? Do you know how to increase the peristalsis or wave through the uh, alimentary canal, the digestive tract? Uh, No. Well, I'll show you. I'll teach you so that you can slow it down or speed it up depending on what the issue is, diarrhea or constipation. Um, you know, in, every one of us has talents and abilities that are undiscovered, and it really is empowering. And I guess that's what got me so hooked on it. Um, and it's not just individuals that have an illness 
that it's beneficial for. But, you know, some of the performers, uh, musicians, uh, opera singers, baseball players, uh, athletes, it's delightful to work with them because their motivation is so high. They want to do better. They want to do well and they want to do it even better than before. So they're highly motivated. They're not looking for something out there to do it for them like a pill mm -hmm. or a diet or something. They're, they know they've learned to rely on themselves and that's, that's what's happening with the hypnosis. It's very empowering. We, we teach it to somebody and it's like teaching them how to ride a bike. Once you know how to ride a bike, the next question is, where do you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> you know, where would you like to be comfortable going? Okay, so on that note, where do we want to go? Uh, I know one of the sort of tools in your toolkit when it comes to hypnosis has been, you know, looking at people's relationship with food and their body, mm. you know, things like weight and things like the habits that we have around eating. And I know you've even written a very interesting book on the topic. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you can just share some of your experience in the field of the usefulness of clinical hypnosis when it comes to things like working with weight when it comes to pieces like working with, you know, my unwanted habits with food. Mm -hmm. Be happy to. Uh, I think it's very helpful for individuals that are struggling with some type of weight or eating behavior that they don't like. Um, so much of, you know, our, our eating, we just take for granted. People aren't trained to eat. They learn to eat based on the family they come from and where they went to school. And it, it, sort of by default, what they had time to eat, when they had time to eat, and what they could afford to eat. And without necessarily being mindful of uh, making good, wise choices about nutrition. Uh, and certainly the medical students and residents I work with, I mean, they're, they have a voracious appetite for nutrition because they barely get an hour of it in the whole, whole of medical school training. But getting back to your question, uh, you know, there's several, several ways that hypnosis is useful for people with weight problems, eating problems. One is to, once you've taught them how to do hypnosis or they learn how to do it, whether it's through like one of our books or audio recording, um, then you want to help them look at, okay, what am I eating? Why am I eating? Um, where is, where are some of the problems? Is it what I'm eating? Why I'm eating? Sometimes people are eating out of emotion. Uh, I think one of my, the first early papers I did in the, oh, 35 years ago was about women under using hypnotherapy for, um, obesity. Mm -hmm. And what we found was that one third of the women had had some kind of un uncomfortable, uh, sexual experience. Somebody had taken advantage of them, and the weight they put on after that became a form of protection. It insulated them so that their attractiveness didn't invite that to ever happen again. Um, another third of them had um, experiences of loneliness. Somebody left. Mom went back to work. And I remember one nurse... Oh, when I first began, in the first session of hypnosis, I asked her the question, or I asked her mind-body the question, perhaps a part of you knows what, what purpose eating those sweet, the sweet foods do for you. And she just lit up and opened her eyes and said, oh my God, I just had a vivid experience of the first day my mom went back to work as a nurse. I was eight or nine years old. I, was, I came home from school. I opened the door and mom wasn't there. And there on the kitchen table was a note that said, honey, I, I, there's some vanilla pudding in the refrigerator for you. I'll be home in about 30 minutes. And she said, I could still remember how good it tasted. So sometimes people are nourishing their emotions with food and not realizing that that's what they're doing. Or they may even know they're doing it, but they don't know how to stop or put it on a different take a different track. And another third of them had illnesses where they were encouraged to eat. And the idea being, and particularly of my generation, you know, when, uh, all the children were almost force fed. You know, you couldn't have a skinny child and a healthy child. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you wanted your kid to be plump so they could survive whatever might come along to their way, tuberculosis or something. So if children were sick, Food became associated with survival. You've got to eat. 
you've got to eat. You'll get better if you eat. And you've got to eat for me. And oftentimes a parent had nothing left to offer to comfort their child during an illness or a trauma other than something to eat that was pleasant. And by giving them that pleasant food, the child then sees their parent's face with a sigh of relief that they've now done all they could do to make their child comfortable. And uh, they associate that with comfort as well as doing the right thing. And uh, so that those thirds broke out that way, illness, emotions, and trauma. And uh, so some people, that's the nature of why they're eating the wrong stuff. For others, it might just be poor learning habits. They just, you know, they grew up in America eating the high fat, salty, high sugary stuff. And they fell prey to the advertising in America that is over sweetening with high fructose corn syrup and God knows what else, uh, or even worse, aspartame, I guess, some of the artificial sweeteners that we know cause weight gain. Um, so working with people with weight problems means looking at why you're eating, what are, what's behind, what's the mot what, are other, what hidden motivations are there for eating, then looking at what are the obstacles to changing and helping them change so that they can start moving into having a love affair with food. And that's exactly what we did in, in that one book I wrote with my wife, The Self-Hypnosis Diet. We, we have a chapter on creating a love affair with food, the taste, the textures, the flavors, what you're eating, because and to, you can have the most passionate love affair in the world with your food if you're choosing, making wise choices, vegetables, fruits, things that conform to a, a healthy pyramid uh, of regime of eating. Um, and then also being able to uh, discover that, you know, I'm now nourishing myself with positive thoughts and ideas. I'm not, I threw my scale away. I don't need that anymore. I'm now uh, looking at exercising more. In fact, we use the hypnosis to remove the barriers and blocks so they can fall in love with physical activity, even if it's chair yoga. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Um, in fact, my wife became a yoga instructor uh, and combined the two. She's a nutritionist by training, but now she combines yoga with uh, the eating to help people get moving or moving their body or at least getting connected to back to their body. And the hypnosis is a lovely way of making that mind-body connection as well and making the associations that let them discover, you know, there's these hormones, ghrelin and rep, uh, leptin, that can manage uh, appetite, satiation, and, you know, you can do things emotionally, mentally in your mind that have an influence on the endocrine system and the neuroendocrine system. Um, so it, it just, for me, it just keeps getting more and more exciting as we learn more and more about what are all the other mechanisms we're tapping into. So that's, that's so in brief. What, what I usually work with or what we work with, with weight and mind-body. Mm -hmm. So really, it's less that the hypnosis is being used to try to fix someone, like taking a diet pill, and more it's, mm -hmm. it's this, it sounds like the vehicle for exploration on the one hand. Right. Yeah, empowering them to go ahead and look at what are the obstacles and remove them. Mm -hmm. because those obstacles aren't out there. You know, the obstacles are all within. You know, as I tell people with regarding hypnosis, everything you need to do this is already within you. You, you don't need anything from the outside. This is an inside-out job. And I think with our eating, you know, if we don't make wise choices, if we don't move our body, if we don't pay attention to healthy nutrition, um, man, it's like trying to swim up a waterfall. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we can, we have to make that, I love the, what you call your institute, the psychology of eating is a perfect term. We have to ma match the psychology of eating with the nutritional choices that people are making mm -hmm. and creating the patterns of eating and nutrition that allow them to have, I guess what you'd call their perfect weight or the ideal weight that's healthy, happy, and uh, lets them live a good, healthy life. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this question, Dr. Stephen. In, in your decades of doing this work, has there been anything that surprised you in the, in the, in the realm of um, like pleasant surprise or wow surprise? What's, mm. what's really 
caught your attention over the years? Uh, it happens every week, Mark. <laughs> I mean, every week. Um, every, every week something is happening that just knocks me over that, wow, that's, that's amazing. So um, let me pull one out from like, wait, go back to wait. Uh, I was, saw a woman who, she's 30, in, let's say 34 years old. She's uh, probably close to 300 pounds. And um, the weight, she's had the weight for about 12 years. And she has a couple children, and she's worried about her heart now. And so she's, I guess, desperate enough to explore, you know, seeing a psychologist. And in the first session, it's the first, second session, the first session, I had her, took a history, had her come back with some photographs of herself before she gained weight. And she was a model, a professional model. And she had just got scholarship to a modeling school in, uh, I think, Wisconsin. And she was the first student to arrive for the, for the new semester. And she said she was greeted by the janitor because there was no one else there. She came so early and he opened the door and he showed her to her room. And in the course of doing hypnosis 20 minutes later, when the question was sort of posed to her subconscious, um, is there a reason for this weight? Is it serving a good purpose? And she spontaneously started describing that the same kindly janitor came up and raped her. And that trauma of being raped led to her putting on weight from that day forward until by the end of the second semester, she was basically had to leave the modeling school because she just it was becoming obese. And so those kind of things to me, you know, uncovering, exploring and uncovering something that can make all the difference in the world always wows me. Uh, a woman I was working with, one of the most charming women I, I think I've ever worked with, bright. And my mission, I was told by uh, the people at our integrative medicine program, you've got to convince her to have this surgery to remove an adrenal gland. So there's a cancerous tumor in it, it well documented with studies, imaging, whatnot. And she was very adamant that I'm not going to have that surgery. It's too drastic. I'm not going to go through that. I don't think I need it intuitively. I don't think that's what I need. So she closed her eyes. We were doing, going to do some hypnosis. And I asked her uh, just casually saying, what's the name of the tumor? What's the tumor's name? And like a knee jerk reaction, she just said, Henry. And I said, well, ask Henry what he's there for. And she said, save my life. And I said, how's Henry going to save your life? by getting me out here to this program to meet Dr. Weil and to change my life. And she had moved from Belgium, where she was heading up a world banking organization, a very high, powerful position for a young 38-year-old or 37-year-old woman. And the next time she went for, I told her, oh, Henry, thank you. You got the message. And the next time she went for a scan, uh, you know, they're all ready to do surgery. There's no turmoil. There's nothing to image anymore. So those always wow me. When, and, and there's several cases of, you know, where people will develop a physical structure in their body. And after doing some hypnosis, it's gone, whether it be warts um, or internal warts. A little five-year-old that we worked with that had warts on her vocal cords. And um, one session, probably no longer than 10 minutes total, and the next time she went to uh, be examined, um, they, they just anesthetized her thinking, well, we're going to scrape the warts off her vocal cords again. We do it every month. And there were no more warts on her vocal cords. And mm -hmm. that was probably 17 years ago. Wow. So I'm, those are the kind of things that wow me all the time. I, I never know what, what people are going to achieve and accomplish, but I always insist they've got to take all the credit for mm -hmm. what they do with their hypnosis because... Because it all, it really all is self-hypnosis. All hypnosis is self-hypnosis. You know, the, the words miraculous kept coming to my mind, you know, often in the culture, we'll use the term miraculous healing when we can't describe, you know, yeah. exactly the mechanism of what happened. So some of these stories like feel miraculous, but really what I hear underneath is, well, not really 
because yes. there's a there's a there's a wisdom, there's a science behind it, there's a psychology behind it, there's a mind body science behind it that makes sense. Right, and this is not new stuff. I mean, this goes back to ancient China. Mm -hmm. It goes back to you can find it in the hieroglyphics. Um, you can find it in uh, the sleep healing temples of Asclepios in ancient Greece. Yeah. These sleep healing temples were where people would recline on a little stone inclined bench called a, oddly enough, Kliny, K-L-I-N-I, Kliny. It's where we get our word clinic from, a uh, place of healing. And, you know, they would just go into a reverie in this darkened little room and Asclepios would come in and say something like, you can eat anything you want now, your stomach's healed, or uh, I'm going to take your headaches with me. So uh, let me have them and I'll take them away now. It's just a suggestion because after Mesmer was run out of town in the early 1800s uh, in fr France, um, some British surgeons and doctors studied his data, which he did fortunately did keep good notes and records. And they found that, you know, he wasn't, it's true, the commission that looked at his work said that he wasn't doing medicine. He wasn't letting any blood. He wasn't using leeches. He wasn't using poultices. Uh, he was using what he called organic or animal magnetism. He was offering suggestions with words while he was passing magnets around somebody. And they found that even though his methods weren't what they called modern medicine at that time, uh, his results were far greater than anyone else was getting. And that led them to then look at how this mind-body healing was happening, the word hypnosis was misnamed uh, hypnosis, hypnosis from the god of sleep, but it's not sleep at all, it's a waking state phenomena. So this is not new stuff. Yeah. It's been around a long, long time, and it's a part of our nature. This is not something out there that we have to go get. Mm -hmm. It's something we have to be motivated to learn. Yeah. And then we've got, because we've already got what we need within us mm. to use it. Dr. Steve, I want to ask you a question about language, because you mentioned early on, okay, when you work with a patient, you might, you know, go over a certain script with them, or if you're making certain suggestions, I, I just started noticing your, you, you, you chose your words carefully, even just saying, right. I'm making a suggestion, just the way you use language, it sounds like it's important in this experience called hypnosis or self-hypnosis. And I'm just wondering if you can say a few words about that. Yeah, actually I could probably say a lot on that. <laughs> I, I was so blessed that uh, in the early 1970s, middle 1970s, I had an opportunity to visit and uh, spend some time with one of my teachers, a fellow named Milton Erickson. Ooh, and Milton Erickson was because he had had polio in high school and then later in his, I believe in his 50s, that affected his speech, he became a master of observation and using words carefully. And we think of Ericksonian hypnosis and Ericksonian techniques because of the language. And one thing we know is that, you know, like all of us above the age of nine or 10 use two basic forms of language uh, to think with figurative language, where we use figures of speech, and literal language, where we're talking about something that is concrete. I use the example in my office uh, of a cup. If you have a cup, it occupies space, it has weight, uh, it's literally, concretely, a solid, it's a thing, it's matter, and it's a cup, we call it a cup. But something like a try, I can't show somebody a try and say, here's a try, here's what it looks like, here's how big it is. A try, or the word try, is a figure of speech. The same as the word N-O-T, not. It's a figure of speech. We know what we mean when we use them, but our mind body, again, once we're nine or 10, uh, our thinking mind uses them all the time. I'll try to be on time, I'll try to get my shoes tied. Um, Thing, you know, figures of speech like, you know, mom coming through the kitchen saying, oh man, this headache's killing me. And the teenager says, hey, take a couple ibuprofen, chill out, chillax, as in here nowadays. And the five year old might say, don't die, mommy, because they take it literally. The five year old is not doing that figurative, abstract thinking yet. So the child takes it very literally. Um, you know, 
the book was read. Um, does that mean the book was read? Or does it mean the book was the color read? The book was read. You know, so the careful choice of words is because the mind body, that subconscious with, 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 that is the mind of our body, only processes with one language, and that's literal language. So the word try or any word is going to be put into a literal form or the mind body is going to literalize it as best it can. So try doesn't mean do. Try means put on trial. See if it's this or see if it's that. And I remember one study that impressed me immensely back in the early 70s was somebody had given a group of randomly assigned group of patients with urticaria hives um, a prescription for a topical steroid and told, try this for two weeks. And another group randomly assigned, assigned from the same pool, same prescription, but told, use this or do this for two weeks. And the group that tried it had half the success of the grape of the group that used it. Mm. So the mind body takes everything literally. So the, the words have to be very carefully chosen. And that's also the beauty of imagination and imagery or visualization. Because if we can picture it and imagine it, it's there's no semantic difficulty. It's already in literal form. It's sort of like the idea of pray when you pray, pray believing that you've already received the answer to the prayer. The prayer has already been answered for you. So like move ahead into the future and put yourself in the environment of it's already done. It's already happened. You have what you want. And what would it feel like? What would it be like? That's a very powerful message to the to the mind body. Mm -hmm. um, so th you're right. The, the words are a very, very uh, important part of it. And it takes a while to train people to use them. And that's pretty much why I record their sessions mm -hmm. when I'm speaking, because, you know, I'm looking to very carefully craft very uh, succinct, concise suggestions that don't leave room for any failure that really are going to open the door to having something change. Yeah. You, you know, Dr. Steve, it, it feels like what you're describing on one level is that there's a place where we're in constant um, self-hypnosis uh, because I'm in constant dialogue with myself. Um, I am talking, I'm using language, even if I'm sitting somewhere being quiet, there's oftentimes, there's a little, there's a little chit chat going on in there. Mm -hmm. And, and it's what, what, what I'm kind of getting from this conversation is it's probably useful to see and notice the conversation that mm -hmm. I often have with myself or even with anybody when I start to talk about how I'm doing, my, my state of being, my relationship with food, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, it seems like I can hypnotize myself in a direction that I might not want to go in. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else might say, maybe that usual state that you're in and the way you talk to yourself some people are more optimistic, some are more pessimistic, some are very, feel a sense of entitlement, some people feel uh, diff they have a pattern of how they ordinarily think. Maybe that's the program that's running now, and that's maybe the trance they're in. Mm -hmm. And with hypnosis, all we're doing is changing those patterns. Um, you know, we're just changing those patterns so that we don't get the results that those patterns produce and we get the results, another pattern will produce. Mm -hmm. um, and I see it in all kinds of fields. Uh, one of my best friends was a professional musician, a guitarist named Howard Roberts. And when he was crafting the curriculum for what at that time was called the Guitar Institute of Technology, now the Musicians Institute in LA, we put together some ideas on how to show somebody some things with music and the guitar, and then within 10 minutes have them put their instrument down, close their eyes, and rehearse it mentally, and then come back to it. And just inventing techniques to put that subconscious to work as if it's already been achieved. And the rate of learning is impressive. I mean, it's, you may be, I, some, most people are familiar with the studies uh, that were first done or published at University of Wisconsin of taking three groups of people to shoot free throws right now, you know, basketball and group they each each person in the group shot 25 free throws and they recorded their average or their score 
And the, the first group were told, during the week, the gym will be open, come shoot 25 free throws every day and do your best to, to make them. The second group was told, come back next Saturday, don't do anything during the week. The third group was told, go home and during the week, sit in a chair, close your eyes and imagine you're right here on this line looking at that basket and you shoot 25 free throws in imagination and everyone is good. You can bounce in, swish through, whatever, but it's good. When they came back the next Saturday, the group that physically practiced improved by 28%. The group that did nothing was unchanged. And the group that just mentally rehearsed improved by 27%. Only 1% <laughs> different. So that mental rehearsal really is helping to create new patterns in mind. It's a neuro, I, re, I believe it's a neuroplastic effect of like in creating a new circuit in the brain, in nervous system, that replaces the old circuit. Mm. So that rather than get the results of what the previous program running was, we've now got this new one. Um, so I guess it is like you said, it's like hypnotizing yourself to have a new program running, uh, reprogramming your brain that way. Mm. You know, to me, this is, this is such an empowering conversation because it keeps pointing to how what goes on in our inner world is so potent and more potent than we could have ever known, perhaps, and potent in a positive way if we use it in that way. Uh, and, and, and I think that's, um, we need that <laughs> as a world. Absolutely. A and, uh, you know, for me, it's a great joy to be training physicians and psychologists and social workers, other therapists and uh, techniques of clinical hypnosis so that they'll be doing it and using it. Uh, because sometimes it, 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 it gets, even though I say all hypnosis is self-hypnosis, sometimes it's somebody else saying something that makes all the difference in the world. And one of the docs in our integrative medicine fellowship training program had gone through three levels of training with the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis, but she was always afraid to use it because she was afraid she'd say the wrong thing. And the week before she came out here for what we call a residential week of training, she said she had a man literally dying on the operating table. He was bleeding in, in his belly. They couldn't find the ruptured vessel. And as fast as they pumped blood into him, it was coming out. And she said he was literally dying. And she said, I didn't know what to do. And I was desperate. So I just said to him, and these, these are the words, something like what she said. She said, Mr. Taylor, he's under anesthesia, out of it. And she said, Mr. Taylor, I've got a problem and I need your help. There's a vessel in your belly that's bleeding and I need to find it. So turn off the bleeding. She said, the bleeding stopped. And this is something that routinely we do use hypnosis for to alter blood flow. The bleeding stopped. They shuck, suctioned him out, found the vessel. She sewed it back together, pumped him full of blood. And she said later that night when she visited him in his room, he asked her, he said, was there some problem during my surgery? And she said, there was, but you, you helped me fix it. Wow. So sometimes it's, it's things that others might say to us or offer to us at the right time with the right words and our body responds even if we are in a coma or if we're in an you know under anesthesia patients the body the mind body is still responding oftentimes to what's being said mm. beautiful story and and i i just want to let's call that the the cherry on the cake of a great conversation and, you know, very enlightening for me and I'm sure for a lot of people tuning in. Dr. Steve, I would love if you could share with us how people can learn more, stay in touch with you and your world, understand what you're up to. What should we know? Well, first I like to say, if you're looking for somebody who's qualified in hypnosis to work with, the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis <clears throat> has a website, ASCH, their acronym, American Society of Clinical Hypnosis, ASCH.net, and they have a find a practitioner. And most of the members of the other legitimate um, professional associations are all members of that one as well, including internationally. So I would say that's where you want to find a, your therapist if you need one. And for me, I have a website called healingwithhypnosis.com. And on my website, I have some free downloads for experiencing hypnosis to 
remember dreams, to remove holiday stress, a uh, few others, as well as a variety of topics in some of the books that I've written. So healingwithhypnosis.com. Great. Well, Dr. Stephen, thank you so much. This has been so enlivening and enlightening, and I'm glad you and I finally got to meet. I've kind of had my eye on you and your work for a while, and uh, I'm just thrilled and and really thrilled that you're out there teaching this and, and imparting this wisdom to practitioners so it can really get out there. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I've always admired the psychology of eating, what you've put together. I mean, it, and it's a real delight to finally team up with you to, and, and participate together. Yay. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in.